Welcome back, Dr. Fadorero. Last time we did asthma, let's do a little COPD today. Um, so we wanted to talk about, you know, there's a ton of COPD patients that we see, uh, especially from lower socioeconomic um, backgrounds that may never have access to a pulmonologist or maybe very tough for them to see uh, specialty care. So we end up seeing them pretty often. And when we see them, they're having a flare, we'll give them albuterol, ipratropium, some steroids and send them on their way. Um, but what else can we be doing to help manage them other than you know really trying to get them in to see pulmonology? Yeah, um, it's a great question. It's great to, to be back uh, talking about COPD. I think it's um, one of those diseases that uh, everyone sort of uh, knows about, but uh, I think there's a, a lot of sort of changes that have occurred in the last couple of years with some of the medical management side of things. Um, you know, I think there are sort of two components to that. Um, one, which is maybe the idea of what may be underlyingly causing people to be more severe than, than others. Um, and I think this is something I always highlight with the fellows or residents when I talk with them is, you know, I think whenever we see a person with the disease, there is often a reason why one person gets really sick or maybe in the hospital with COPD um, at 45 years old and, and another person is, you know, has no problems till they're 90 years old, right? Or never. Um, you know, I think the mo most common link that we think of is obviously um, tobacco use or smoking. Um, and I think, you know, if we talk about things that we can do for them, if I had to highlight one thing, it would be working and helping to do tobacco cessation or trying to get people connected up with that, because I think that's pri primarily still the, the the main thing. Now, is but I think considering other... also like a ex is that an exposure that can lead to COPD? That's a great question, and and generally we don't think it has the same potential effects, um, or at least the same degree of effects in creating COPD. But to be honest, I don't think we know completely yet. Um, we do know that it's really connected with sort of reactive airways or some of the other sort of obstructive uh, issues, asthma. Um, but we don't think it's quite the same degree of, of COPD production. And it's mainly because COPD is, and mostly especially emphysema, is a disease of sort of protease activation. So it's a disease of destruction of the elastic fibers. So the, the problem is, is that when people develop emphysema, they get these big air spaces because all those sort of rubber bands that tie to those alveoli, when they get destroyed, they it creates like a lack of of sort of structure and all those areas become much bigger. And that, that's obviously problematic because when you don't have the elastic fibers, those spaces no longer tie to the airways and the airways get floppy. And that's why you get obstruction. And so I think anything that creates inflammation in the way of activating destructive forces like proteases can cause this. And we know a lot of the substance not even not the nicotine, but usually all the other stuff that's in cigarettes is what is activating of these and also creating oxygen free radicals and other things that, that does all of this. Um, you know, one of the things to highlight is that you have to consider other conditions sometimes that can also do that when you think about, um, you know, things that you may want to send for, especially people who are not being seen regularly because they may need to have other involvements. Um, one of the really um, uh, ones that's under-recognized actually is HIV. Um, so HIV can actually uh, activate proteases as well. And it's actually irrespective of CD4 count. Um, and so pretty much most patients, and I think generally everyone should have HIV testing, That that's sort of a, a tenant I, I think I believe in and is actually the recommendation. But especially if you see people who have never been tested, who have emphysema, especially if they're younger, um, I think sending HIV testing would be would be a good idea. Um, and then also, you know, there are detectable viral loads. This is going to be still a, a factor or it can. Um, so it turns out that the actual virus, if it's undetectable, probably less so. It's actually the virus itself that's activating these. Um, but but sometimes you have sort of viral presence, but but, you know, CD4 counts are are you know, controlled. Um, and we do occasionally see people who end up with this. It's 
still not the most common outcome. Like not everyone with HIV is going to develop emphysema, but if you're seeing a person in front of you with emphysema, um, that that considering that as a possible um, comorbid thing is important. Um, you know, I think other ones that as pulmonologists we consider. Um, so there are people with who have alpha one antitrypsin deficiency, and you may uh, remember this from med school, but it's um actually a disease that affects the transportation of the the enzyme from the liver, which is why people who have the homozygote uh, disease end up with liver disease and lung disease. Um, but there's a whole component of people who actually have heterozygote disease and their their levels are not that high and they generally don't get lung disease except if you are a smoker or if you have other environmental uh, uh, exposures um, that actually can cause early emphysema much more readily. And so actually the reason that I recommend uh, to most of my colleagues to check this uh, in emphysema patients or if people are in the ER potentially is that actually knowing that you have a condition like that is much more likely to help with smoking cessation or actually in the next generations, they've shown that their children or even grandchildren are much more likely to quit or never smoke. Um, and so I think that it's something that considering that, especially in patients who aren't involved in other care, other places may be really impactful potentially in identifying a, a reason for, for emphysema. So what are the actual tests we send out for alpha-1 antitrypsin? Yeah, so most systems um, actually have uh, uh, alpha-1 orders. So it would be an alpha-1 phenotype and alpha-1 level. Um, the, the phenotype or, is, or the genotype is, is helpful in that you get the actual alleles, um, which is what can tell you if you have sort of heterozygote disease or not. And especially for people who are smoking, that would be the important sort of discussion. Um, there is actually a way that you can, uh, and actually in our pulmonary clinic, and we have it in our resident clinic, um, through the University of Florida, it's where the Alpha One uh, Center is. Um, you can actually connect up with them and they will send you free packets that you can actually do a point of care test for the patient and send it out and they get the testing back to themselves. Um, and uh, actually, they you know their their test will go for uh, sort of research purposes, and so that is an option if if anyone ever has clinics or other places that they're operating that 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 can be done for for free. Okay, um, and then just to interpret the results that we were to get, you know, this the genotype makes sense if you have one of the mutant alleles. It could either be heterozygous or homozygous. My understanding is there's different mutant alleles as well. There's different types. Which we don't, that I don't, is true. We don't have to get into too much, but then the yeah. alpha one antitrypsin level, what, like, what are you expecting to see there? You know, I think, you know, part of the helpful thing, especially if this is a patient that's not connected to a lot of the other care is, you know, I think if you were to find any disturbance where the level was low, lower than expected out of the normal ranges, or they had an allele that was abnormal, I think, again, really the importance of seeking sort of subspecialty care or, or more aggressive care would be very helpful. There are certain patients with very low levels that can get replacement of their alpha-1 uh, uh, antitrypsin. Um, you know, that gets into a much uh, more nuanced discussion about, about that and effectiveness, but I think just the importance of that is just it would really push the importance of having them seek sort of secondary or subspecialty care uh, for, for, their, for their disease. Okay, great. So HIV, alpha-1, what else? Um, the other third, like sort of most common thing is usually uh, actually immunoglobulin deficiencies. Um, so if there are people that were especially frequently getting infections like pneumonias or these like, you know, respiratory bronchitis, um, there are actually quite a number of people who end up with sort of IgG deficiencies um, that can actually predispose down the road towards, you know, destructive uh, activation in the lungs. Um, so patients, usually those are the three things I send, which would, in that sense, it would be IgG subtypes. Um, I would say that wouldn't be sort of, you know, at least in the ER, maybe not quite as common. But again, if there are people that have that sort of like, like infective phenotype of their COPD, where they're coming in all the time with, you know, infections, um, you know, that may be helpful because some of them end up needing actually, you um, uh, replacement IVIG or otherwise uh, uh, to help with their 
um, their frequent exacerbations or, or infections. So what what do you mean by IgG subtypes? Uh, what does that mean? Yeah, so there's an order that would actually be IgG subtype, and it's looking at IgG 1, 2, 3, and 4, which are part of your immunoglobulin pathway. Um, and each of them carries a different um, uh, immunologic uh, sort of component of how your body fights infections. Um, the ones that we often look for are IgG 1 and 2 um, deficiency, um, but uh, any of those being very low can impact your, your body's ability to sort of fight infections. And then frequent sort of infections can also be downstream, uh, uh, especially, you know, uh, 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 pulmonary infections can be downstream creators of inflammation and eventually early COPD. So even when someone's in a flare, these tests are reasonable to send, like the being in a flare won't mess up the IgG levels or? None of those should be impacted necessarily by being in the middle of a flare. Yeah, they're all fairly uh, static. If you were very low with your immunoglobulins, that, uh, regardless of the time, that would be a problem. Okay. All right, great. So that's super helpful. I mean, yeah, there's so many patients we see regularly with COPD exacerbation. So we're drawing blood anyway, you know, might as well send some of these labs out uh, that could be useful down the line for the patient. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, the other things that I think you had mentioned about uh, sort of other things to think about, I mean, I think really medical management in terms of choice of, of inhaler and things is also a key component. Uh, I think that's one of the things that hopefully uh, uh, it comes up in the, in the ER, I guess. Yeah, exactly. So I think, you know, I think we're pretty comfortable treating the flare, um, albuterol, ipratropium. We're going to give steroids. We might give magnesium. And depending on, you know, how they're looking, they may get admitted. We may bypass them. You know, we know all that stuff, but let's say we're going to discharge them. Um, what are the right meds to be sending patients out on for, for yeah, think, management of this sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, I think for sure, still for COPD, it's an obstructive physiology, meaning the airway narrowed, hard to come out. So it's really focusing on how to get the airways to be more open. And I think generally, generally inhalers are the first line for, for this. Um, and, you know, interestingly, I know there, I think we talked about in the asthma section too, is that there's a chart of a million different inhalers and sort of asking like, what do we put people on is always the first question. Um, over the last maybe like 10, 15 years, there's been a big sort of, you know, uh, amount of data and amount of research that's gone into looking at these sort of ideas. And the things that we're mainly looking at are one sort of day-to-day um, uh, -day lifestyle uh, outcomes, like how well do people feel, how well can they walk, um, then also time to exacerbation. And then thirdly, sort of side effect profiles, especially for people with COPD, sort of risk of other infections um, becomes a predominant sort of outcome. And what I'll say is, for a long time, I think people were tending to utilize inhaled corticosteroid-based regimens up front. So often you'd find people on long-acting beta agonist inhaled corticosteroids. So, you know, Advair, Symbicort, Brio. Um, and, and really um, what sort of has come out over time is that inhaled corticosteroids and people with predominantly um, COPD is actually associated with higher pneumonia risks and not necessarily better outcomes. And so I think because of that, there's been a big push towards utilizing non-inhaled corticosteroid-based regimens um, upfront. Now, what I would say is, again, there's this idea of sort of step-up therapy. Um, and I think trying to get necessarily away from the fact that everyone has to start one place and step up, it's more about severity level, right? And, and I think in the ER, if people are coming in with flares, that may mean a lot of these patients are more severe than less severe. And that's the same for me in the pulmonary clinic. People are usually referred to me because they're not doing very well. And so I'm tending to start at higher levels. Now, um, generally, that would mean sort of a dual inhaler, so using two of the subtypes, and the subtypes usually being inhaled corticosteroids, uh, long-acting muscarinic agonists, and long-acting beta agonists. Now, the last two being ones that are more in, involved in sort of helping to increase airway uh, diameter, um, less so inflammation. And so often people get started on the 
LABA, long-acting beta agonist, LAMA, long-acting muscarinic agonist as the first line. Um, and, you know, an example would be like a noro ellipta is one of the examples of a LABA, LAMA. And um, that actually has been shown in moderate um, or moderate to severe disease to be um, better than many of the other inhaler regimens. And, and the other inhaler regimens, like, yeah. this is more like using it like a controller or you're using Every it day. Like, Every day, okay. Every like day, twice a yeah. day, so, type of thing. Um, it depends. So, a noro is a once a day. Some of them are twice a day. It would just depend on which inhaler. And generally, a, those between the classes generally haven't been shown to be preferential to another one specifically. So, I think it would often come down to insurance coverage or what what yeah. is available for the patient. Um. The, the the comparison really was to what would happen if you thought someone was a more mild uh, patient, which would be to actually generally start with a long-acting muscarinic agonist. Um, we generally don't use long-acting beta agonists solo. That's generally not found to, that's actually been found to be sort of detrimental. So um, the LAMA inhaler would be a single inhaler. Um, so examples would be Spireva, people hear about a lot, um, there are a variety, but those often would be first line for patients with mild disease. But again, if you're talking about someone in the middle of a flare or something, often stepping up at least to that moderate may be the right thing. Um, the caveat to this is, is there are some subtypes of people that you meet who actually seem like they may have both asthma as well as now downstream COPD, like they actually have chronically developed airway problems all the time. In those patients who have asthma phenotype or allergic phenotype, um, actually starting with that um, long-acting beta agonist with the inhaled corticosteroid would be the right person. And again, that's really a history discussion the the uh, and a discussion asthmatic. with the patient. What's okay. up? So treating it the same as an asthmatic patient in someone that has COPD plus asthma. Correct. Yeah. And it's because if, if you're assessing that you think inflammation is a part of this, not just chronic narrowing, then I think really treating the inflammation would be very important. Um, you know, it's where, so you give a patient, say a LAMA, LABA, or just a LAMA, and you're taking this, you know, once or twice a day as a controller, patients always seem to want something you know, throughout the day that can help them? Like, a, a, you know, what if I need extra? So would you just tell them to take another dose of that? Or would you give them an albuterol inhaler in addition? Or I think generally for these patients, albuterol inhalers still are available or, or thought of as the rescue inhaler component. Um, I do think many of the patients with COPD um, have other comorbid problems that can be going on. This often goes together, like people may end up with heart failure for a variety of reasons or other things. And so there are sometimes it's really important to sort of educate the patient on when to use that, um, because people often sort of use it for any time they feel anything, right? And sometimes you can't make them feel completely better. A lot of these diseases are irreversible in the sense that developing emphysema that's we can't make their lung better and so there are times that like when they go up the stairs they may feel a bit short of breath and so educating them that not every time you can you need to use albuterol maybe you can rest for 30 seconds and you'll regain your breath and that would be okay um, because I think sometimes people feel short of breath and so they end up using it 10 12 times a day and I think that's really um, sometimes detrimental to, to to what should be going on. Are there, is there anything else you would recommend that we think about or discuss with COPD patients um, prior to discharge? Yeah, I think uh, in many of these patients, if they get really severe, often may have outpatient providers and things that they're seeing, whether a pulmonologist or otherwise. I do have to say the data is pretty good that um, short steroid bursts versus long steroid bursts and not that high is probably okay. Meaning like choosing prednisone 30 for five days for an exacerbation is probably okay compared to like a 15 day taper. But I mean, there are sometimes some of these patients, um, especially the pretty severe COPD patients 
do tend to have need for longer steroid tapers. And some of them end up actually on chronic steroids um, because they just literally are on all the inhalers and 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 basically um, can't do what they need to do day to day. Um, so I think that communication sometimes or, or discussion with outpatient, because I know for some of my patients, uh, there are just times that the short burst may not work, but that's a can be a little bit tricky. But I would say overall for these patients, steroids is still the upfront right thing for an exacerbation and um and you know probably shorter uh is is probably okay um the other thing is often it comes up uh, discussions of things like um uh oxygen therapy or if people are are sort of desaturating uh walking around like what 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 does it what needs to happen? And I think there's really two questions. One is in the setting of the acute issue. So um, if the person's acutely hypoxic, um, that may be a reason even to have them stay in the hospital for a day or two. Um, but sometimes people say, hey, this is literally where I've been living. Uh, and I see a lot of these people walk into my clinic who are sitting at 82% or something, and that's what they sort of always live at. Yeah. Um, oxygen replacement, um, for under 88% would definitely be the right thing to do for anyone just sitting there at rest. Um, and they should be given oxygen to be above above that, essentially. Um, and usually looking at whatever amount they need, two, three, four liters, um, and at home would be the right thing throughout the day. Now, is there a um, number that you're trying to get them to with oxygen therapy? Usually above 88%, um, but I think often people target like 90 or something just because it's an easier round number. And I'm not trying know, to get it, up to 100, you know. Um, actually, there is some thought that maybe that's not a great thing for chronic uh, obstructive lung disease patients because actually over oxygenating them may take away part of the body's sort of breathing respiratory drive. It hasn't actually turned out that that's it's a little bit controversial, but I think they definitely have never shown benefit of pushing up their oxygen that much. Um, but, you know, the, the second question is for those patients who ambulate and drop chronically, and that's definitely more controversial. And there's been studies in the last couple of years that have suggested maybe that's not as long-term outcome benefit from a mortality stem, standpoint, um, but maybe there's some benefit towards endurance of, of exercise. Um, so that's something that you know, you could have a more nuanced discussion with the patient and maybe it's not the end of the world if they say, hey, I don't want to go home with oxygen because I dropped to 87 percent um, when I walked around. And that wouldn't be the craziest. There are many patients that lifestyle wise wearing oxygen is not something they want to do. And I won't often push them if that's the only time they're sort of de desaturating. And then there's some benefit, you know, rehab, pulmonary rehab, there's, you know, that's a key component as well, I'm I'm guessing. Uh, for the oxygen or? Just in general, like in general. Know, different things we should be thinking about with these patients. Pulmonary rehab, if if that was accessible to, to refer from the ER would probably be the most helpful thing of anything that we've just talked about <laughs> in some ways. Um, so as time has gone forward, pulmonary rehab, rehab has become more and more robustly shown to be helpful from a data perspective. And I think of, we've even shown some mortality benefit and probably more to come, to be honest. And I think it's because many of these patients start to feel chronically unwell and don't do anything. And because of that, they get muscular weakness, they get just uh, debilitated, and that can be a cycle that is uh, unexitable. And so I think... Um, um, not only is it a helpful thing from muscular strength, but they also learn a lot of good breathing techniques and ways to deal with anxiety that comes along with, with dyspnea. And finally, I think it's a way to get people into the system sometimes, right? Um, and to be able to access, you know, a system that's occasionally hard for some of these patients to do. The only caveat to that in most places, definitely in Rhode Island, is that most insurance companies require um, pulmonary function tests within a year um, to qualify for pulmonary rehab. Um, so occasionally even getting set, helping to get them set up for pulmonary function tests ahead of time would be helpful because that may help to, to open up a, an avenue to getting that to getting that option. That's great. And pulmonary rehab generally, it's it's like a cardiovascular workout type thing, 
Yeah. So, so essentially there are specialty trained respiratory therapists and phys physical therapists that work with the patient. Um, they usually, most of the organizations set up um, classroom time um, to work on inhaler techniques, to work on things like breathing techniques, uh, sometimes mindfulness training, because that can honestly be very helpful for people during times of, of dyspnea. And then following that, they generally go and do a, a variety of targeted weight-based exercises to help with uh, core strengthening um, and, and thoracic muscular strengthening, which plays a role in, in respiratory physiology. And then finally, cardiovascular exercise. So they usually are on a treadmill or bicycle um, and essentially working on sort of endurance and, and all of this being tracked sort of quantitatively. Um, which is actually not only just helpful just to see improvements, um, sometimes can elicit things like uh, hypoxia or, or otherwise, but also I think for patients, um, it can be really helpful to see that they can do it and they can improve because many patients just start to believe they, they can't do these things. Um, I want to take one of these classes. This sounds amazing. Oh, honestly, I've never met uh, a person that doesn't like pulmonary rehab. It's like a uh, social, social hour. It's uh, it's pretty fun. It's great. Um, question for you, like PFTs are still the gold standard for diagnosing COPD, right? Like they should have abnormal PFTs. So by definition to define COPD, it is a PFT diagnosis. Okay. So chronic obstruction is the, the, the definition, you could get a CAT scan and see emphysema, um, and then you could say pulmonary emphysema, but pulmonary emphysema doesn't necessarily mean chronic obstruction, because um, it's really a physiologic parameter. Now, and that PFT a, is going to be your FEV over FVC under 70%. Uh, generally, yeah. So we, we actually read, so there's two criterias, um, one being the gold criteria, which is one of the international uh, COPD consensus guidelines. That's an absolute below 70%. And the reason it's the ratio is, is that you're really just asking the question internally validated to yourself, how much air do I blow out in one second compared to total? And they say 70%. There is the American Thoracic Society uh, recommendations, which is what we read here which is actually by um, lower limit of normal. So it's two standard deviations below the mean for your predicted. And, and the, the reason there's a little controversy is because um, you can under and over diagnose potentially. So in a younger patient, um, um, you know, or in an older patient, you expect some aging uh, elastic uh, uh, fiber reduction. And so their airways definitely don't have the same expected ratio. Um, and so you could potentially, uh, you know, under diagnose a younger patient and maybe over diagnose someone who's older. And so I think the key is just understanding what the numbers are saying, because at the end of the day, uh, the numbers are the same. It's just how you're interpreting them. Um, and so I think you could have a person in front of you that you know that, okay, I think this is obstruction. You look at their ratio and it's 70% and you're like, I think this is, you know, an obstructive disease and it may be true. Um, and, and so I think it's just that understanding of like what your what, what ratios and what, what appearance you're looking for on the breathing test more so of, you know, obviously we all, we all sit in boardrooms when we come up with these things. And, uh, it's just at the end of the day, a consensus guideline of where to draw the line, but. Okay. All right, cool. Um, anything else you wanted to, you thought could be good for us to know about from the ED? No, I mean, I think, I think this is, this is really helpful. I mean, I do think, um, I think one of the things I always highlight to people is I think one of the most over-diagnosed things in all of medicine is COPD. And I mean, that as in, I think every person who ends up in a hospital system who's ever smoked one cigarette in their life has COPD written in the first line of their of their uh, chart. And it's because like any dyspnea, uh, that's a common thing to do, even when they don't have PFTs, even when they don't have other things. So I always just say like, these are also patients that have high risk for a lot of other diseases. And so I, I just think it's important. And often we find these patients when you do their PFTs or something, they actually have completely different physiology or they're having some other problem. Um, so I, I think it's just important to have that healthy uh, 
sense of sort of uh, not anchoring to every time it's a COPD exacerbation because often often they they may have other comorbid problems. Great. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for setting this up. This was wonderful. Yeah, very fun.